For this first WebGL video, we're going to create the simplest possible WebGL 2 program we can. It'll be so simple, you'll wonder what the point is, but I promise it will be worth it. Throughout the series, we're going to return again and again to the code that we write here today. It'll be the foundation and jumping off point of every video that's to come. So the most minimal WebGL program is built from three things. A canvas, a WebGL rendering context, usually named GL, and a program linking two compiled shaders. Here's our HTML page. It already has a canvas in it. I've wrapped it in a thin gray border, which you can see here. The script that we're linking to is a TypeScript file, but don't worry, this is not a TypeScript series. It's just that my IDE is better set up for TypeScript than for JavaScript, but everything that I write in the series will be completely regular JavaScript. Next, we need a rendering context, usually called GL. This rendering context variable is so ubiquitous that it's almost impossible not to know what it is and why it's important. Most directly, it's the interface that we use to issue all of our WebGL commands. It contains all of the functions we use to create WebGL state, manipulate its contents, and render things to the canvas. In a word, it is WebGL. What's maybe easier to miss is that you can have multiple rendering contexts. If you want to render to two canvases, you must have two rendering contexts, two GLs. But we're only going to have one canvas in this series, so let's not do anything fancy. Currently, WebGL contexts come in two versions, regular WebGL and WebGL2. Obviously, WebGL is the rendering context we used in the previous version of WebGL. WebGL2 is the latest version, and it provides a whole bunch of new functions, optimizations, and speed improvements. Of course, this is the version that we're going to be using in this series. How do we get a rendering context? Naturally, we get it from the HTML canvas element itself. We're targeting WebGL2, so we specify that here. Last, we need a WebGL program. We're not going to do this here, but all the code that we're about to write really belongs in its own function. That's because most WebGL applications will have more than one WebGL program. But I want our code in this series to be as simple and linear as possible, so this won't be tidied away into its own function. GLUseProgram is how you switch between WebGL programs, and even if you only have one program, you won't be able to do anything with it until you call this function. So, we have a program, but we see here that it's not valid. To create a valid WebGL program, we need linked compiled shaders. Here are the general steps that you'll always follow. You'll notice that the process is identical for vertex shaders and fragment shaders. First, we create a shader object. Then we set its GLSL source code. Then we compile the shader. Then we attach it to the program. When both shaders are attached, the final step is to link the program. If all went well, the invalid program we began with is now valid and ready to work. So let's create our first shader. It's a vertex shader. We'll add some GLSL source code and compile it and attach it. The GLSL source code doesn't exist yet, so let's create that. Because we're using GLSL 3, the very first line must contain this version directive, or nothing will work. Also, I'm using a VS Code extension called GLSL Lint, which shows errors in my IDE, and this line enables it in my code. Now, our incredibly simple program. It's just a single point in the center of the canvas. Great. Now, the fragment shader. Our GLSL code is going to be just as simple. We'll just output the color red. Hmm, so this isn't working. Now, 
I, I know what the problem is. In fact, GLSL Lint is warning of an error right now. But it would probably be a good idea to get more debug info than just this. If you want to do this properly, I recommend that you check out how a WebGL library like Twiggle.js does this. Okay, so even though we got that error, let's try to link the program. Whenever linking fails, the program parameter link status will be false. And if it's false, you can check the shader logs for any warnings and errors. Checking the log is expensive, so we don't want to do this unless we have to, unless there's an error. Okay, so there's a lot wrong here. WebGL doesn't seem to like my Pragma directive very much, but that's just a warning that's okay during development. Really, the problem we're seeing here is in our fragment shader. In GLSO1, we used to set the output color of our fragment shaders using the built-in variable glfragColor. But we're using GLSL3, and in this version, glfragColor doesn't exist anymore. Instead, you must declare a vec4 output, and you can name it almost anything you want. And that still doesn't fix it, but this time we see there's a precision error. That's an easy fix. If you're not sure what this error means, I have another video explaining precision I recommend that you check out. So now, let's draw our point. This seems strange to use draw arrays when you have no vertex data, but that's okay. What we're doing here is completely legal, if a bit useless. We are drawing a point to a static location, and we're drawing it only once. Success, except no point. This code is correct, but there's nothing on the canvas. The problem here is that we have an incredibly small point. Let's give it a decent size. Okay, now it's working. Not very useful, but this will work fine as a starting point for all of the videos to come.